I was speaking yesterday about syllables that are stressed and syllables that are unstressed. Stress is, first of all, a property of words. When we learn a word or look up a word, if this word has more than one syllable, then the issue arises, where is it stressed? On which syllable or which syllables is there a stress? Uh, is there a stress? Um, to be a little bit particular about the terminology, what this really means is when we say the word in isolation, which syllable will receive an accent? Stress by itself is very difficult to perceive. And even very good observers differ a lot about whether something is stressed if there's no accent around. It's only when the stressed syllable is marked clearly by a pitch accent that everybody says, yes, that is stressed. And this is the source of a lot of confusion in discussions about stress, because people say and think they're talking about stress, and really they're talking about accents. They're hearing pitches, and they're not hearing these really very, very slight differences in rhythm and timing, which are the, the real stress differences. If you want to investigate what stress is like without pitch accent, then you have to investigate stress in whispered speech, for example, where there is no pitch. Or stress in speech made on a monotone, where there can be no pitch <coughs> variation. And then you will find people differ enormously in where they think the stresses are. I differ with my own colleagues. <laughs> Uh, if we're listening to a, a stretch of speech where there's little pitch variation, uh, we won't always agree on where we think the rhythmic beats are. And I think it's the same thing in music. People can listen to a piece of music and hear the beats and the accents in different places. You interpret it in a different way, especially if you hear only a snatch of it that isn't in a bigger context that tells you the rhythm. So. Stress in words is something we hear by detecting accents, really. Whenever we pronounce a word in isolation, we will make a single intonational phrase out of that word, and that intonational phrase must have a nucleus, and it's that nucleus we're really picking on when we say that is the stressed syllable. So stress is shown, as you see here, by the stress mark, which is a raised vertical mark, and it's put in front of the whole stressed syllable. Not just on the vowel, or beside the vowel, but in front of any consonants which begin the stressed syllable as well. So here are two words which differ in stress pattern. Pillow, the thing on which you rest your head, and below, the familiar word below. Pillow is stressed on the first syllable, below is stressed on the second. And you'll notice that the stress mark is put in front of the P of pillow and before the L of below. Placing it before the L of below is making it do two jobs. First of all, it's marking where the stress is, but it's also telling you where the syllable division is. Um, that, that sequence of sounds could be arranged in a different way. It could be Bill and O. Oh. Uh, right, there is a name Bill, and there is a verb to O. Oh. So I could ask, how much does Bill owe? <laughs> how much money does Bill owe? That's not the same as Bill owe. <laughs> it will have lots of differences. One difference might be in the kind of L that is produced. Bill might have a darkish L, Bill O, and Bill O would definitely have a clearish L, but there would also be timing differences to which, in appropriate circumstances, you might detect. Of course, a lot of linguistic contrasts, a lot of the things we're interested in hearing, are really only potential contrasts. Some of them are very robust and it's hard to get rid of them, but other differences well, you can't rely on them 100%. They come and go a bit. If there's a bit of noise, a bit of variation, then you don't always pick up exactly what is intended. Now, 
This is what stress looks like in physical terms, in terms of fundamental frequency. On the left, I'm saying the word import, which is the noun, import. And on the right, I'm saying the verb, import. Import. fundamental frequency curves is pitch, its fundamental frequency. So you're actually looking at an accent difference. Remember, you're seeing the location of a pitch accent. On the left, the pitch accent is at the beginning. On the right, the pitch accent is on the second syllable. And then it goes indirectly from the location of the pitch accent, you infer where the stressed syllable is. You're not directly detecting the stressed syllable, you're detecting the pitch which marks the accent that's been, that's been locked on to the stressed syllable. <coughs> we sometimes um, talk about secondary stress as well as primary stress. Here is a word concentration as it might appear in a dictionary, it's as it does appear in the Advanced Learner's Dictionary, for example, concentration. Now you see two stress marks. The one within the word, before the T, is the one I just referred to, this raised mark, which is the main stress mark. And there's a lowered one right at the beginning. And unsurprisingly, that lowered one means a stress of lesser importance, a subsidiary stress or secondary stress, so-called. To be honest, I don't like the term secondary stress at all. I don't believe there is any such thing as secondary stress. Uh, it's just another stress. What is secondary about it is how much accent it's receiving. Uh, concentration, there are two stresses in the rhythmic sense. The second one has the big accent on it. The first one has the smaller accent on it. And that's why it seems to be secondary or subsidiary. The first one, of course, is dispensable. You don't have to do it. You can pronounce concentration and keep only one stress or uh, uh, try, at least, to make the first one very quiet. The first, or so-called secondary stress, can be made strong to varying degrees. If, if you really want to, you can put a strong pitch accent on the secondary stress and say, concentration. Concentration. Now they both seem very big. <laughs> They're both big pitch accents. And if you were just to say which is the biggest, 50% of people would vote for the first one and 50% would vote for the second one, probably. Uh, how do we know which is which? Well, it's just the order in which they occur. Remember, the last accent is the nuclear one. So, secondary stress. When you are uh, dealing with long words on their own, you may really want to mark secondary stress. If you're transcribing whole sentences or passages, you have to be guided by your tutors, but I, I never ask people to mark secondary stresses in transcription um, myself. Uh, I know other people take a different view. They, they may want to mark it, but I, I think once you're dealing with the rhythm of connected speech, you've just got stresses. And uh, as, as far as their status of stresses go, they're all pretty much the same. So there's the secondary stress and there's the primary stress. You can have more than one secondary stress. If there are several of them, it feels like a rhythm building up to the main stress. So here's this word, indivisibility, a word I'm sure which you have to use every day. <laughs> Uh, now, at least, you will be able to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> it's quite a challenge to think of a common context in which you have to use this word. <laughs> so for the advanced learners among you, I set that as a riddle. Find a plausible context in which you have to say indivisibility. Um, as far as stress, in simple words goes, 
as you will know by now as learners of English, you can't tell where the stress is going to be. You have to know, you have to look it up in the dictionary. This is one of the most important uses of the dictionary for a learner to look up a word and see where the stressed syllable is. If that was all that the dictionary did for you, it would be invaluable. Because, as I explained yesterday, if you pronounce with a stress in the wrong place, the word is very, very difficult to process. It's much more difficult to process than you logically think it should be. The stress is just this funny little mark, isn't it? What difference does that make? <laughs> And surely, there isn't another word like this one. How, how can you possibly fail to understand if the stress is in the right place? But if you don't have the stress in the right place, you derail, you spoil the whole process of perception. The poor listener is trying to find different ways to make sense of what is coming in. And there are many, many stories of miscommunication based on wrong stress. Um, I said you have to look it up in the dictionary. That is by far the best bet. Uh, if you, let's suppose you're in a situation where you're faced with a word, you must read it aloud, you haven't got a dictionary, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> the safest thing would be to put the stress on the first syllable. Um, English is a Germanic language. Germanic languages favor initial stress on the whole. Some are very good about having initial stress very regularly. So if you're really stuck, try the first syllable. In the 19th century, when phoneticians first began transcribing English, sometimes, if the stress was on the first syllable, they didn't bother marking it. They just said, we'll assume the stress is on the first syllable unless it's marked otherwise. That was quite a sensible thing to do. Uh, I wouldn't mind reintroducing that idea, because it forces you to think about the stress in a way that you don't think about when you just see them all marked every time. So when I pick up a bit of Henry Sweet, and there's a word with no stress marked, I think, oh, there's a misprint. Oh, no. Of course it isn't a misprint. He just assumes I'll put the stress on the first syllable, and that's what he wanted. We have a lot of compound words in English. There is a very, very productive process that makes new compounds all the time. I think when you're listening to English, you can't go more than two or three sentences without coming across a new compound or a compound noun. And so it's very important to understand where the stress goes in regular compounds. And it goes on the first element of the compound. More particularly, it goes on the stressed syllable of the first element of a compound. If you make up a new compound for yourself, you know that the stress will be on the first syllable. If you make up some improbable compound, you can predict exactly where the stress will be. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, we have something called chewing gum. Chewing gum, okay. You know what chewing gum is. Now, chewing gum comes in a pack. This is a chewing gum packet. <laughs> chewing gum packet. So the stress is still on the first syllable of chewing. And then suppose you had somebody who had the strange hobby of collecting the packets in which chewing gum came. This person would be a chewing gum packet collector. <laughs> chewing gum. And the stress is still on the beginning of the whole thing on the word chewing. If you were to mangle that, you, you, again, as I've explained, you probably disturb the listener's process. Of course, when you look up compounds in your helpful textbooks, you'll be told, oh, but there are some exceptions. What about, what about Christmas pudding? There it's on pudding and not on Christmas. Well, there are a few exceptions. <laughs> there are a few exceptions. Maybe there are some quite common exceptions which you need to know about, but that doesn't mean there's no value in the main productive rule, which is to put the stress at the beginning of a compound. Here are some compounds, sunglasses, lamplay, pen knife, teaspoon, you can go on and on like this. Of course, uh, many languages 
have some kind of phenomenon like English stress. You speak Spanish, you speak Polish, you speak German, you feel you recognize something that's like English stress, and so you may have rules that are leading you to try and place the stress in other positions, in words. Uh, we have one or two speakers of Polish here, don't we? Yes? All right. So, Polish, thank you. <laughs> Polish is very, very well known as a language which favors putting the stress on the penultimate syllable of every word. But next to the last syllable, there are a few exceptions and so on, but basically it goes there. And when Poles speak English, they often do this, <laughs> uh, applying this penultimate stress to English. So, uh, one of my sons has a Polish girlfriend. I get to hear a lot of Polish-influenced English. So, I've heard the word landlady pronounced landlady. Now, as an English listener, if somebody says to me, landlady, I'm completely stuck for a second or two while my brain goes round and round. What on earth is this? What word has the pattern da-da-da and begins with an L? Um, that's how we do it, you see. We, it's kind of rough lookup. First you find the pattern and then you fill in the details. So when she said landlady, I had to do, as we say, a double take. Um, the same girl said internet. She wanted to connect the computer to the internet. What on earth is the internet? I don't know. I'm the author of a dictionary. What is this word internet? It sounds like something to do with infernal. It's got to be an adjective or something. What is it? But it, it must be internet. Internet with the stress on the first syllable. And there are two unstressed syllables following internet. If you move the stress to the middle syllable, no, you spoiled it. Um, I just want to return to secondary and primary stress for a minute. Some of you are very advanced learners of English. Um, this, is, this is a little detail, but I have noticed that one of the things which sometimes reveals that a person, however good their English may be, is not actually a native speaker, is a little mistake with secondary stress positions. Um, so, for example, if we take a word like accommodation, accommodation, the, the main stress is on the day-dation bit, and the, the secondary or subsidiary stress is on the second syllable, accommodation. And yet you hear people whose English is almost perfect saying accommodation. Accommodation, putting the secondary stress on the first syllable. And as soon as that happens, I think speakers of Dutch do this, don't they, Ben? Accommodation. Yeah, and I think I've heard a poll doing it as well. And you have this perfect English and then accommodation. And something says in your mind, oh, oh that's not right. There's something wrong. What is it? The ordinary listener doesn't know about secondary stress. It's just a little clue that this is not the right pattern. Of course, if you've reached the standard where your only problem is the occasional error with secondary stress, you don't really have any problems. <laughs> when you put words together, once you put English words together, you have strings of words, and the stressed syllables now form a rhythm. As I explained yesterday, we thought about a limerick. There was a young man that devises. There are the beats in the rhythm were the stressed syllables in a sequence. And it is often said that English has a stress-timed rhythm. Well, there's a much longer word, isochronous rhythm, just means same time. Isochrony. This is an old observation about English, and this is contrasted with um, at least one other type of rhythm called syllable timed rhythm, which is meant to be found, for example, in French, where every syllable is more or less the same in duration. Now, in order to speak English, uh, 
uh, in the way I was describing yesterday, you have to make big differences in your syllables. The syllables can't all be alike. They must show big differences in prominence. And when we listen to this as a whole, when we listen to a phrase, we tend to hear this beat going along, and we have the feeling, or some people have the feeling, that the beats are kind of regular in time. Now, this is a lovely idea. The, the, the best description of it was actually worked out by a man called Arthur Lloyd James, who was a lecturer here in the 1920s. And if you're interested, I can actually show you a clip of film in which he's explaining this to other people. Um, and it's a lovely idea. He, he didn't call it stress time. He called it Morse code rhythm. And the other one he called machine gun rhythm. But it's the same idea. that The term stress time and syllable time, I think, were brought in by Kenneth Pike, who was an American phonetician somewhat later, to refer to the same idea. So when we hear there was a young man of devices whose ears were different sizes, the, the idea is if you, you plotted the time between these beats, they'd all work out to be equal. Unfortunately, when you measure them, you find they're not. <laughs> they are not. So, uh, isochrony, equal timing, is not borne out in any detail by uh, close measurements. But that doesn't mean it's wrong or a bad idea. It just means that we perceive something as being regular, even though it's not perfectly regular. As a matter of fact, our perception of times is very poor. We're very bad at judging intervals of time. We're very good at judging pitch. You, uh, you move a pitch by a tiny percentage, and you can hear immediately that it's changed. In my lectures, I make big falls and big rises, but in real speech, you hear some which are tiny, yet they still do the job. And if you're a singer or a musician, then a tiny percentage change in pitch will hurt you because it, you're out of tune. <laughs> yes? you, you only need to move by a tiny percentage and you detect it. Change the duration of an interval by 1%, nobody will notice. Change it by 10%, still nobody notices. You need big differences, and ideally you need things next to each other for comparison immediately. So you get some people who have perfect pitch. They listen to a pitch, they tell you the note. And if they know which notes are how many hertz, they can say, oh, that's 123 hertz. And I'm sure of that. And I have colleagues who have perfect pitch. I don't think I have got, my pitch perception is quite good, but I'm not as good as being able to put a number on, on the pitch. Um, but I've never heard of anybody who had perfect duration who could listen to something and say, well, that's 73 milliseconds. <laughs> now, this is absurd. <laughs> we don't get that. So if, if something in English rhythm tends to make the stresses more or less equal, then when that's been through our rather approximate perception, the result is they seem to be equal. It also means that stress-timed rhythm, the idea of isochrony, is not a bad idea in teaching. You see, if, if you've measured the duration you found they're not equal, then you might conclude, oh, well, I can't teach them as equal either, because my students will then get the rhythm wrong. But, believe me, I have never heard a learner of English whose speech was too rhythmic, <laughs> who had too much isochrony, who had, whose stress timing was too perfect, it's always the other way. It's not good enough. It's not nearly enough equal. So uh, I'm all in favor of rhythm <coughs> drills which encourage you to aim for equal timing. There's no danger of getting too good. So although the idea of stress timing is not confirmed by measurements, we can understand where it comes from. It's still quite a good description of what we perceive, and it's not a bad idea in teaching either. Why does it happen? Well, the reason why the intervals between stresses get to be rather similar, to form within a fairly narrow range of possibilities, 
is because of this variation between strong and weak syllables. Some of our syllables are long, others are very brief. So, if you add more syllables to a sequence, if they're unstressed syllables, their effect on the duration is not very great. Mm -hmm. uh, still, the timing, the overall timing, is more or less dictated by the, the main landmarks, the main stressed syllables that you put in place. So a good way to practice this is actually to take a sentence or phrase, get rid of some of the unstressed material, practice just the stressed syllables, and then while keeping the same rhythm, add more and more of the unstressed material without getting slowed down. And it's better, at least in practice, it's better to slur or mumble some of the syllables, provided you keep the rhythm going. I think a lot of rhythm is spoiled by people pronouncing too carefully. They're trying to give full values to all the unstressed syllables. Never mind. <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't work, scrap that syllable and get to the next big one. That's the, that's the rule. <laughs> um, now, some learners say, oh, I can't do that. I can't possibly uh, skip things or, or abandon them halfway through or mumble them. But from time to time, it's not a bad idea to try. Um, I don't quite know how to encourage this. You have many experienced teachers here who may have tried. Speaking without moving your jaw isn't a bad idea. Just speak with your mouth shut like this. <laughs> and then you're not taking up time to move the articulators around and get to extreme positions. Forget the extreme positions. Um, you don't have to hit every vowel and consonant target perfectly, especially if doing that spoils the rhythm. Keep the rhythm going. That's the important thing. Probably one of the main reasons why English tends towards stress timing or isochrony is this effect here called uh, rhythmic clipping, this is an effect whereby as you add unstressed syllables to a stressed syllable, the stressed syllable itself gets somewhat shorter to make up for the extra time. So if I take the word play, that's fine. But if I compare play with playful, play, playful, you can hear that the play in playful is shorter than the one in play on its own. If I don't do that, I get playful. Playful, which is wrong. <laughs> it sounds like a foreign accent in speaking English to say playful. <laughs> it's playful. And then if I add another syllable, playfulness, play, play is now much shorter. So I've gone through play, play, play. <laughs> They're getting shorter each time as I add more material. And you can see what this has the effect of compressing what you're trying to say into the more or less the same time. It doesn't work 100%, but it does a good job at keeping the rhythm uh, isolated. Yeah. So this kind of stress-timed rhythm is important to practice, and this effect within words is well worth knowing about. Unfortunately, the durations of English syllables are affected by all kinds of factors acting together. And it's hard to control them all. The, the nature of the consonant at the end of the syllable also has a big effect. Uh, so we like to say, for instance, that the word um, use and the word use differ in the final consonant. Use is a verb, and we think it ends in a Z, well, it might. Use is a noun, we think it ends in an S. But the big difference between those two, really, is that use is very short, and use is very long. Uh, you can make a mistake with the final consonant. As long as the vowel's right, people will judge correctly. If you say, for instance, use, use, with a long vowel and then an S, people will probably think you're saying use with a Z. If you say use, 
used with a short one and a z, they'll probably think you're trying to say the noun, which should have an s. So this uh, works along with the rhythmic clipping that I've mentioned. You have to get the two things untangled. Um, but none of this detracts from what I'm saying, that it is worth practicing rhythm. It is worth practicing rhythm, and I think the stress time goal is quite a good one. The other thing which helps with English rhythm is our use of weak forms. Now, as learners of English, you know that many of the commonest function words in English come in two shapes, the so-called strong form and the so-called weak form. If you are uh, a native speaker of English, then, especially my native speaking students, a, don't believe this, and B, can't understand what the fuss is about. It's the perfect example of unconscious linguistic knowledge. Uh, the native speaker never makes a mistake with weak forms. I can't recall any case in which a native speaker made some mistake with a weak form. We just don't do it. It's, it's completely unconscious and automatic to us. And yet, from the viewpoint of a learner of English, it's crazy. There's all these words, and they keep coming in two different forms, and how do I know which one to use? <laughs> uh, and what's worse, if you don't get the right one, then you spoil the rhythm, and often you spoil the comprehension as well. So, many of these weak forms have a schwa, but, uh, the, t, as, and, but, was them. In fact, I shouldn't even pronounce them on their own. They don't have that kind of separate existence. They're only little bits of phrases into which they're incorporated. They're almost like inflections. They're almost like bits of other words. And indeed, some of them do get attached to other words, um, as far as one can tell, in some of their behavior follows from that. And I cannot say this strongly enough, this applies even in slow and informal, that is, speech which is formal. You, you cannot improve English by getting rid of weak forms. Um, again, I have never encountered a learner of English who used too many weak forms. There's a, there's a slight exception to that, which I'll mention in a moment. But usually, somewhere, the learner of English will use a strong form instead of a weak one. And this, again, is an indication that this is not a native speaker. If you do not use appropriate weak forms, then you can get misunderstandings. On the left, the two people having a conversation, this can be called a one-to-one. One-to-one. -to -one. One -to -one. The preposition to is in its weak form. Notice there are two stresses. There on the two uh, words, the two occurrences of one, and there's an unstressed syllable in between. On the right is the phrase one to one. One to one. Now notice, this is not stressed. This middle word is not stressed. The point is, it's just not weak. It has full vowel U. And if you say one to one, Nobody thinks you're talking about a conversation. They'll think you're talking about a bus, one to one, which runs in my part of North London. This bus says one to one on the front. Uh, and I think it's true to say that from the native speaker's point of view, one to one and one to one, they have no connection in your head. They don't, they don't even sound alike. You never think of them as being related. They're completely different. So the moral is, suppose you want to say something that contains a ter, then say a ter, say a proper schwa. Don't change it to a u. Otherwise, you're going to make difficulties, and you may even create misunderstandings. Here's another one. In a shop on the left-hand side, they were selling jam and chutney. In a special offer, you paid for two, and you got three. This is three for two. Three for two. But again, if you 
don't use the weak form and say four instead, you'd have three, four, two. Three, four, two, that's again a number. And again, notice it works even if this is not stressed. The choice of the strong vowel versus the weak vowel, this is an independent choice from whether the thing is stressed. The way it works is, if the word is stressed, it can't be weak. But if it's unstressed, it could be strong or weak. This is a separate choice. This is probably the biggest misunderstanding caused by failure to use a weak form. I hear examples of this routinely every few weeks. I want to say in British English, I can do that, or something of the sort, with weak form, can, or can. But if instead of can, you say can, I can do that. You'd think it ought to be clearer than I can do that. But no, it's not. I can do that will probably be interpreted as negative. That is, I can't do that. Why? Because the negative auxiliaries don't weaken, and the positive ones do. So if, if instead of can, you say can, the listener thinks, ah, that's a strong form, it must be positive, therefore the whole uh, it must be negative, I beg your pardon. Therefore, the polarity of the sentence is the other way around. Of course, the vowel would be different in British English. Uh, it, it ought to be calm, but that's a tiny detail because everyone knows that in American English you say can. Can, I can't do that. Can. So, can, can, any, any speaker of English, whether British or, English, or, or American, will probably interpret can as negative rather than positive, especially if it's unstressed. Stress it and say, I can do that, then that's, that's clear again because we've now gone to the emphatic use. So we use weak forms. As you know, uh, prepositions, words like the and uh, to and so on, they're weak when they're within the phrase. If they're at the end of the phrase, if they are stranded, to use the syntactic term, then they have to be strong. It's not all weak form words that must be strong at the end. Prepositions are an exception. Pronouns weaken even in final position, but prepositions do not. And this is very interesting. Why should prepositions stay strong in final position and pronouns not? Well, uh, I have an answer to that, and that is because prepositions are actually proclitic. They're attached to what follows, and pronouns object pronouns and so on are if they're attached to what precedes. And therefore, in the case of prepositions, when nothing follows, they cannot be attached and therefore they can't be weakened. That's why they remain strong. So we say, what are you looking for? We can't say, what are you looking for? No, that's completely out of the question. Um, I'm looking for the key. Yes, there it is weak. That's much, much better than I'm looking for the key. I'm looking for the key doesn't sound right. It should have the weak form of fur. But once the preposition is at the end, it must be strong. And notice yet again, it's not stressed. The for, in that first example, is not stressed. It's just strong. So this just calls attention to the items I've been talking about. Summing up then about stress time rhythm, what is the best advice? Use a proper schwa. Use a proper schwa. You will never waste your time if you practice schwa. Collect words that contain schwa. Every time you notice a word where you should have used a schwa and you haven't, write it down and think about it and collect other examples like it. Always Look things up in the dictionary. If the dictionary shows a schwa, use a schwa. But you can't make up your own weak forms. It doesn't follow, as I've said, just because something's weak, it doesn't mean that it's, um, just because something's unstressed, it doesn't mean it has to be weak. So the word on, for example, is a preposition, and surprisingly, it doesn't have a weak form. 
at least he doesn't have a weak form obligatorily in ordinary casual speech. I, I don't want to say it has no detectable weak forms. You, if you listen to casual speech, you will hear weakening of on. But that's at a different level. <laughs> Um, if you're speaking reasonably carefully and slowly, you don't weaken on. Yeah, but in the same style of speech, you must weaken for and at and to. So we don't say, I'll see you on Tuesday. If I say, I'll see you on Tuesday, it means I will see you, and at the same time, I will see Tuesday. <laughs> um, um, a common tea time snack in, in Britain would be beans on toast. Beans on toast means beans are on top of the toast. Beans and toast would mean separately some beans and some toast, without the beans being on top of the toast. So um, that's not the reason why it doesn't happen. I have no idea why on doesn't weaken. It's just one of those things. English is full of these things which are lexical. You just have to look them up in the dictionary and know. And the other thing which some advanced learners do. This is the kind of thing that Russians get wrong when they're speaking English. Um, remember that just because a syllable is unstressed, it need not be weak. Volcanic, volcanic must have the vowel ot in the first syllable. We had a lot of talk about this in the spring when Europe was engulfed in a, a, a cloud of volcanic ash from Iceland. Volcanic and it's a very interesting word because there's this unstressed syllable which is vol. You may not say volcanic. Volcanic is just rubbish. It's not English at all. Nobody says volcanic as far as I know. Uh, certainly not in anything, any of the writers you're trying to learn. And so you can't there apply the automatic weakening. So volcanic is right and volcanic is just wrong. So here is a reminder, uh, there are some exercises like this in your handout, of how to practice rhythm. I'll just do one example. If I take arrive London Tuesday, the idea is you say arrive London Tuesday, arrive London Tuesday. And having got that rhythm going, you then begin to add more material. I'll be arriving in London on Tuesday. Not I'll be arriving in London on Tuesday. No. <laughs> Arrive London Tuesday, I'll be arriving in London Tuesday. Okay, do you have any questions? Tomorrow, Jeff will be taking over on the intonation lectures for a while. There's a question. I was wondering, I was thinking about on. On. Could they, I mean, the reason why it's not weak, could it be because people also act in the verbal article as off, for instance? So can many of the other prepositions. Um, I, don't, I don't know the reason. Conduct an investigation. Okay, thank you very much.